Welcome. So I'd like to thank Gretchen and the others for having invited me here. And um, let me know if you can hear me. So probably right now, hopefully you're hearing something that maybe some of you remember hearing a long time ago is the, the buzz of the honeybees. Unfortunately, many people across the country, including my own daughter who's 12 years old, don't get to hear this this much anymore. And I've had numerous people tell me that they no longer see bees or hear bees and have forgotten in part what the sound of happy bees foraging on a tree sound like. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about what, where we've been going and looking at health of bee colonies across the United States and what's going on. So first of all, I'd like to talk a little bit about bees in general and their importance. So bees and other pollinators have long ago struck a major deal with flowering plants to have a sort of a cooperative agreement where the bees and the other pollinators will visit the plants gain nectar and pollen from them, but also go and distribute the pollen to other nearby plants of the same species and help those plants to continue on in, in, in their lifespan by producing seeds and extending their, where they're going. So if we think about the world around us, what we see in a large part are many of these angiosperms, these flowering plants that are out there, then they bring to us much of the color that we see, so right here in spring, a lot of the blooming flowering plants, you can think of them out there trying to advertise for these pollinators to come. We think about what we eat on our table. Tonight, the grad students treated me to some very nice sandwiches, and then the tour de force was the strawberries that were chocolate covered. So even those strawberries wouldn't be here without those pollinators. So pollinators, and bees in particular, have played a major role in our lives and are very important. So to tell you a little bit about bees, those of you who aren't familiar with them, they're actually really cool insects. They're social insects. They have a society among themselves. In that society, we find that there's one reproductive individual. She gets to be the mother of all the queen. And she lays the eggs that will develop into up to 60,000 workers who are unfertilized females. And as they come out as adults, they go through uh, age-dependent a task shift. So initially they come out, they help take care of all the young and the brood, feeding them and, and whatnot, and then later on move on to helping to process nectar coming in to make it into honey. And then some of them shift over into being guards in the colonies. You can think of them giving up their life to defend the colony, others becoming undertakers to help get rid of the dead, and then the major group going out to visit the plants to collect the nectar and also to collect the pollen. And then lastly, we have a few to several hundred drones that get to have life rather easy. So they come out with the one intent purpose of mating with any brand new queens that come along. So unfortunately, they get kicked out in the wintertime. So I guess it's sort of a rule of thumb here for productivity. <laughs> anyway, so these bees that we see here, the Apis mellifera, actually originated in Europe and many different other subspecies or species of apis also formed in uh, Europe, throughout Asia, and down into Africa. Here in the New World, we do not have the honeybee as one of our natives. It actually came over with the colonists when they first uh, colonized and brought many of their same plants, like apples and that here. And if you think about what role bees played back then, it was quite important. So here's a little bit more of the life cycle. The queen here laying the eggs in the colony. Those eggs hatch out into larvae here. And the larvae are fed by the worker bees. They're given royal jelly, a secretion from the head for the first few days, and then shifted over to brood food, which is less nutritious. And then they develop on that and come out as brood. If they want to grow up a queen, she's given royal jelly her entire life. In the brood cells here, the bees transform into the pupa. So you can see the compound eye of the adult here in the eyes and the legs and wings. And after about 11 days, the new bee worker here is ready to emerge and take on her tasks. So that's what's happening in the colony. This agreement between humans and bees has actually been for a very long period of time. We can find cave paintings in Spain that illustrate how people used to crawl up to harvest honey out of colonies. And in Egypt, we can find hieroglyphics that indicate that they recognize the importance of bees. 
And earlier this year in uh, the Middle East, they actually uncovered in some of their archaeological digs signs that there were apiaries over 5,000 years ago, that people were maintaining hives, and interestingly, much of the same structure that they used then is what you see now in certain parts of, of the Middle East. So bees have been long associated with humans. You can think of them as our first livestock of sorts, the insect livestock of the world, that we're actively taking care of them and using them for our food production, the honey, and other aspects. But here in the United States, we've sort of shifted away. It's not so much honey anymore. Hopefully a lot of you enjoy honey and get to experience it. But what we get to enjoy is, is the fruits of the pollination here, per se, that there's over 100 different fruits and vegetable crops in the United States that are dependent upon honeybee pollination. And the value of that several years ago was $14.6 billion. That may have increased by the almond crop in California alone exceeding this amount of money. And in, in Pennsylvania, we know that we have about $46 million that we can attribute to the bees just pollinating apples and other fruit crops. And as I'll talk about here in Iowa, soybeans, you may actually be benefiting in uh, measurable economic means by what increased pollination you get by the bees too. So what happens if we don't have bees? What happens is we don't either, we get no yields if we don't have bees. So some gardeners have told me that they stopped getting cucumbers and other fruits and gotten that in the garden because they no longer see bees or other pollinators. We also know that oftentimes even with inadequate pollination you get low yields. Or in the case of an apple grower, you may get misshapen fruit, so it may not have this nice, rounded, beautiful appearance that consumers want to buy. It's going to grade out much lower, and they're going to get a lot less money. And when we look at what bees actually do pollinate, there's things on the list that you may not necessarily asso associate bees with. So how many people think of, of bees and onions, or bees and broccoli and carrots? We actually need the bees there to pollinate these plants to get the seeds in order to grow the new crop. So without having bee pollination, we would not have these essential fruits. And even the top rated crop is actually alfalfa. So in part, generating the seed for alfalfa to feed the cows, you can even say that bees are in part responsible for the meat and milk production that we see on our tables. And of course, the next big crop here is almonds, which is 100% dependent on on the bees. And some plants vary in how dependent they are. Apples, we essentially need all the bees and other pollinators that we can get. Soybeans, about 10% of the pollination comes from that. But if we think about soybeans, and as you guys in Iowa have obviously been doing this for a long time, and I know that from having been down in Illinois in grad school, um, there's an economic benefit here now to soybeans in terms of biofuel production. So even that 10% increase in yield with soybeans may translate into a significant amount of dollars if we think about future revenue to be generated by these biofuels. So bees are very important there. Unfortunately, for many years now, not just even the last couple of years, this pollination has been threatened or endangered. So in 1987, a mite was introduced in the United States along with another mite species, the varroa mite here, and it rapidly spread across the country. This mite, when it came in, we actually saw a great decrease in number of colonies across the United States and loss of colonies. And many hobbyists, backyard beekeepers, gave up keeping bees because of the trouble that they had in trying to keep their key bees going. It used to be people have described to me that you just had your hive and you got to enjoy it and you didn't really think much about, about the diseases and your queen was there for three years or five years or eight years. But now we find that people are really struggling to keep their bees going year after year. And a lot of that is by the interaction of these mites with diseases. And then we can now think of what's happened with colony collapse disorder as sort of being the straw that might break the camel's back. So with the mite infestation, we saw that many of the feral bees, the bees that had escaped from management in the Northeast, had died out. It's very difficult now to find a feral bee colony. So I know around where I am, I used to see bees, but uh, it's not only now that we put the bees in my backyard that we have them there. So we have a decreased number of managed colonies prior, prior to colony collapse disorder, and this has made major impact now on the pollination. <clears throat> 
So if we look at this in Pennsylvania, we still have a registration requirement for all beekeepers that every hive has to be registered with the state, inspected on an annual biannual basis. And that's been back since 1930s, so way before this. And so what we saw is in the late 1980s that when the tracheal mite, this little mite that lives in the trachea of the adult bees, and the varroa mite came in, we had this huge decrease in number of colonies. And things had started to build as we were starting to figure out a little bit better how to manage the bees and the mites. But then here in 2006, you can see we're doing a town turn. And our concern is, is we're, we aren't sure where this downturn's going and what the outcome is going to be. So that's what I'd like to tell you about. And just to give you an example of how important bees are, this is a scene from Central Valley in, in California where the, this would be like in January, February, right before the almond crop is coming in bloom. And Central Valley has been now planted in large part to many contiguous acres of almonds, pistachios, and other trees. And this is, each of these little white boxes here is a pallet that has on it four bee colonies. Right now, over half the bees in the entire country are brought into California for this pollination. And they've made it worthwhile enough, they're willing to pay enough for pollination to make it worthwhile for people in New York State, in Pennsylvania, to take the bees clear across the country on the back of a semi-trailer into California for this pollination. So what we have here is one of these staging yards where multiple people have brought in their bees. You can see these stacked up. The bees come in, in uh, on the semis, about two, three stacks high on the back of a trailer, and put in this area. And while they're there, if you notice out here, what are they eating? So basically, there's nothing in bloom yet. So the beekeepers has to go in and feed each of these colonies. And they feed them things like sugar water, which is fairly expensive, so they have to go buy the sugar. Or they feed them high fructose corn syrup, which was, used to be cheaper. It might be getting more expensive here. And then they also feed them artificial pollen. So it's basically a diet that has uh, protein in there, soy protein, some fatty acids, sugars. And then some of them have added additional things on top of it to make it a little bit more palatable. So there's a lot of cost and a lot of time that they have to spend with each of these colonies. But here's why they t take it in. This is an almond orchard hidden here. And if you look in here, you can immediately see what the problem is. In this orchard, the only thing growing are these almond trees that are only in bloom for two, three weeks period of time. The rest of the season, there's nothing in here for any other insect to live on that depends on pollination. So these beekeepers are essential part of the system here, this $14.6 billion industry of coming in to get that crop in place. And then after they're done pollinating, the grower says, well, goodbye, go away, and leave us alone. And they have to go off to another area. So we see that many of these migratory beekeepers that do this essential pollination have to move from place to place to place in order to gain their living. Well, all seem to be working pretty well until uh, 2006. So we knew we had major problems with varroa, that people would get about 17% loss annually due to varroa mites and the interaction with diseases. But things went way downhill. So this is Dave Hackenberg. He happens to live in Pennsylvania, about an hour north of Penn State. And um, he takes his bees up and down the East Coast. So he'd taken bees down to Florida and had them in his, his normal apiaries down there. So these are pictures of the colonies here. And he thought they were in pretty good shape, that he was expecting to have them build and grow up to get ready for the next pollination series. He came down, and about two weeks after having looked at them, and much to his surprise, instead of finding boxes full of worker honeybees, he went in and only found four of the hives out of 400 that had any bees in them. The rest either had dead brood inside, and maybe a queen and a handful of few bees, but there were no adult bees to be seen. He couldn't find them on the ground around the colony. He couldn't find them out away from the colony. And so it didn't match anything he'd ever seen before. And he's not a shy fellow. You might have even seen him on TV and because he's one of the most photogenic guys that have been selected here for colony collapse disorder, so we call him our poster child. Um, and so he actually had, really does have two cell phones in pocket and has been known to talk on both of them simultaneously. So he called everyone, including uh, the Florida State Inspector, Jerry Hayes. He called 
USDA with Jeff Pettis. He called Dennis Van Engelsdorf, who's the Pennsylvania State Inspector, and he called us. So he's trying to get help right away, and so we started looking at this. So he reported this. He also started calling his fellow beekeepers and asking them if they had seen anything. And it turned out a lot of people had seen this, but they were thinking, it's my problem. It's something I did wrong. I messed up. Maybe I treated my bees badly. I screwed up. And if I tell anybody, I'm going to be seen as a bad beekeeper. And what we now know is that this is not a bad beekeeping phenomenon, that these die-offs, these dramatic die-offs, are actually occurring, we think, because of a, a of some disease or some aspects that underlie this. So the reports of this increase continued through the summer of 2007, and then it, it went away for a while, but unfortunately last fall it came back. So in 2006 we estimated that a quarter of all USB keepers had experienced ECD, and within those operations that they lost anywhere from 35% to 100% loss of their colonies. So this is with an average of 17% loss across the country due to the normal varroa mite loss. In 2007, we've gone up higher to a third of all the beekeepers having CCD with an average loss of 40%, some of that going up to 100% loss. And unfortunately, this has happened to some of the, the major biggest in beekeeping operations in the country. One of the largest beekeepers in the country has 60 to 70,000 colonies took many of them to California and put them out in an isolated apiary area to get away from all the other beekeepers and away from agricultural chemical use. And he came down with over 40% loss. So instead of calling his bee yard a bee yard, he was then referring to it as a graveyard. And the reports are that other beekeepers that came out there and saw this couldn't stand to be there. That was just so heartbreaking and wrenching that they got up and left. So this is a rather severe problem. So this shows you the extent of it. So the number of managed colonies, it wasn't just the big guys that were experiencing it. Most of them are males that own the, the companies. But we see that a lot of the smaller backyard beekeepers also experience this. And what we see is that the losses are not normal. They don't match our normal symptoms that we see with Varroa and the die-outs that are occurring there, that there's a significant increase. We also know that in Pennsylvania that we had many beekeepers. Some of them never migrate, including Old Order Amish, which um, if you're not from, I think you are familiar with Amish, they don't go very far and very fast because they're out doing everything on a horse buggy that had CCD. So we know that it is not a migratory beekeeper phenomenon. It's not just confined to them. We also know that there's organic beekeepers across the country that also have CCD symptoms, that it's not just something that's confined to people who use chemicals. So what do we see with colony collapse disorder? What we see is this rapid decline in the number of adult bees. All those workers that are in there doing all that hard work, many of the older ones just disappear. They leave the colony and die elsewhere. We're left with the queen and a few handful of very young bees and lots of developing larvae and pupae, but nobody's there to take care of them. But there's also abundant food resources, lots of honey and bee bread left in the colonies. We know that the, they didn't starve to death. And the mystery is that there were no dead bees inside the colony or out on the ground. So where did they go? The other mystery is we see that these colonies are not being robbed out by bees or other invasive insects. Normally when a colony gets weak, it's a sitting duck for its neighbors. They're all coming in and want to take away that honey and the food resources. And it's pretty impressive when it happens, when a weak colony gets robbed out. It can happen very quickly. We had a research colony with 200, 300 pounds of honey on top because we weren't harvesting. We just wanted to have the bees have their own. And um, we needed the queen. And we couldn't, the lab that I wanted to have it looked at, the EM lab, wasn't ready. So they said, well, let's send it to us next week. Well, my grad student went out there and tried to get people to go with him because he was expecting to have to lift these heavy boxes of honey off the colony. And you have a tool that looks like a pry bar that you use to take things apart. So he reached in to pry things apart and basically flipped the box end over end because it was now completely empty. There was none of that two, 300 pounds of honey that had been there one week before. And inside we found the little queen in the corner shivering and lots of dead bees in there. But everything had been taken away by its neighbors. We don't see that happen with CCD. All those resources in there stay there for up to two weeks. We also don't see pest insects come in, things like cockroaches. 
or wax worms or small hive beetles don't come in. It suggests that there's something that they can tell is wrong with that colony, a deterrent in there, a toxin. So we have researchers at Penn State who are working on this who some of the best chemical ecologists in the country trying to figure out what it is about that that's, that the other insects are detecting that we don't know what's there. We also took bees out of the colony, and in my lab we started looking at individual bees, and we could find every known bee disease in there. So this gives you an example of the difference between a healthy colony at the bottom here. This is a frame of brood, and if you look here, it's covered by adult bees. You can't see down into the cells to see the developing larvae or pupae. Here at the top, those little brown spots, that's a developing bee pupa underneath, and there's just a handful of adult bees here. And if you notice, there are no adult bees flying around these colonies. So people knew when they had CCD, they walk in the yard and they can take the box apart and not even have to wear the protective gear. So there's nobody at home to come out and defend the colony. So as you all know, there are lots of wild and crazy theories about CCD. And um, I have to admit, I've heard things that I never thought I would ever hear. <laughs> So cell phones hit the, the news because there was a person in, in Germany that when he put his cell phone out by the colony like this, he found the bees didn't really want to go sit on it. Um, beekeepers have joked that there's a good reason not to give cell phones to your colonies because the young workers will be spending all their time text messaging instead of actually getting the work done. Um, but we have no evidence whatsoever that cell phones or the radiation associated with them have any adverse effects on the colonies. People suggested other things. Um, some which I th I'm not sure if it was in seriousness or not about bees being taken up and being raptured. Some suggested it was a Obama bin Laden plot for terrorism. Some suggested it was the Putin plot that we, we actually do have genetic strains of bees called the Russian strains. They suggested these bees had been programmed by Putin and his colleagues and that there would be this mysterious signal come in and they would just get all get up and, and go away somewhere. So we don't think any of that is there. The other thing more seriously that we don't think is out there on the board are genetically modified crops. We have a fair amount of data from many different labs to say that the toxin, the Bacillus thuringiensis toxin that you find in engineered plants like corn and a few other things, that it has no impact on bees whatsoever, that you can feed as much Bt corn pollen to these bees as you can, and it turns out they really like the pollen. They do extremely well on it. And we don't see any activation, any activity in there. So we don't think that GM crops are the problem. And it turns out a lot of people are really focused on that aspect. The other thing, we're a uh, um, high magnetic electromagnetic radiation and, and uh, cloud trails due to chemtrails due to jets. We don't think any of that is a problem. There are some serious things that we do think are problems, though. One is diseases in the columns. So we think there are disease organisms or pathogens some of them might be brand new to this particular part of the country that might have been there from other parts. Some of them might be newly evolved, hopped over. We also wonder what the impacts of chemicals are, pesticides in the environment. Some of them we know probably come from the beekeepers themselves. This mite that I showed you earlier is a major detriment to the bees, and we know that beekeepers have been struggling to try to control it, that many of them use chemicals that are not legal or uh, registered, but they're desperate to try to find controls. We also know that they're, as you know, in agriculture and in the urban environment, which is probably more significant, that there's many chemicals out there that they're putting out, pesticides, insecticides, herbicides, fungicides. And with some of those, part of the concern is that some of the herbicides and fungicides actually synergize the action of the insecticides. So bees are known to be fairly susceptible to chemicals and that's one of our concerns here. We also know that there's environmental stress, that as we, as humans, have taken over the environment, the agricultural environment and our own home environment, we've actually tended to neaten things up. So things to us that look very nice and neat, we've gotten rid of the weedy plants out there, maybe gotten rid of hedgerows. In our lawns, we don't like dandelions. We've actually taken away a lot of the plants that support these pollinators, so there might be decreased nutrition available. We also know that in bees in the U.S., we have a decreased genetic pool. We've lost many of the people that produce queens and have kept those stocks in place, so there is actually 
a decrease in the, in the diversity that we have in the bees and their ability to respond. So we had been hoping that maybe there might be a pill out there that we could give to try to correct the problem, you know, one simple solution, and we don't think that that's going to be forthcoming. So one of our goals is to develop a diagnostic test and come up with the recommendations and hopefully with long-term solutions to help with this overall. So before we get into where we are and looking at things, I need to tell you about what we know about pathogens and diseases to begin with. So some things are actually pretty obvious. In Pennsylvania, in my own backyard, we know when we have some things get into the bees because they leave their paw prints or they tear apart the equipment pretty well. So we actually have put up major bear fences out there where we are. Other things are much harder to see. They're microscopic. So you can actually, we see every kind of class of pathogens get into bees, but they're very specific. The bees are actually not sitting wimps out there. They have fairly good defenses. So we do find some bacterial diseases, but they tend to be very specific to the bees, like American fowl brood, European fowl brood. We have viruses, as I'll tell you about. We have a whole host of those. We have single cell organisms here called Nosema apis and Nosema serrani that are specifically infect the bees. They're also called microsporidia. There's a few of these that are now turned up in humans. Not the same that infect the bees, but different ones. We have some fungal diseases. Two of them, one's called chalk brood. It actually infects through the gut. And then there's aspergillus, which is a human pathogen as well that can cause infections in bees. And then we have the parasitic mites, the varroa mite, and then the tracheal mite that lives in this one thoracic spiracle right here. So these varroa mites, just to emphasize, this is a major cause of disease and colony loss in the United States even now. So one of the ways that we think this happened is that the mites um, exasperate diseases, that they make it much worse. And part of that is that in my lab we've shown that the bee defenses or their immune system is suppressed by these mites. As the mites feeding on the bees in the in pupil stage, they're probably secreting and salivary proteins or spitting into the bee and that is knocking down part of their immunity. You can think of this being like a tick when it feeds on you, it knocks out part of your immune system. That's why many of the tick-borne diseases are so important. We also know that these mites can be infected by some of the same viruses that infect the bees and actually vector it, that they may help spread it from around one place to another. So these viruses, we actually have a huge number of viruses described for bees. And most of them are very tiny little viruses that you have to use an electron microscope to see like this. And they're pecoronal-like viruses. So what is a pecoronal-like virus? Some of you may probably have heard of animal pecoronal-like viruses like polio and foot and mouth disease virus. Some of the cold viruses that you have are actually pecoronal-like viruses. But insects can get these too. They're a different related class. In the United States, we know that we had one virus, sac breed virus over here, that causes this more phenotype, it was here long before the tr mites ever showed up. So this is a larva that has tried to molt and go to the pupal stage to form a pupa here, and it didn't make it. It formed a sac, and the sac is filled with fluid that contains lots and lots of virus particles. These other viruses may have been here before the mite got here, but we're not quite sure. We have one that caused wing deformity, this shrunken wings here and some beautiful long blades of wings. And these bees are, die very quickly after emergency. We have cashmere bee virus, black and queen cell virus, acute bee paralysis virus, and we don't really know what the phenotypes look like. One of the things that we know is that these viruses can be there at very low levels in these colonies without causing major problems, and they may impact certain characteristics, but we aren't quite sure how to look for them. We do know that some of these viruses, uh, that there's interaction between the mites and chemical pesticides and how they impact the viruses in bees. So with mites, we see that the varroa mite over time here, that it can build up to very high levels in the colony, that they just keep reproducing and building up. And you can go in and do chemical treatments. So at the top is a, an insecticide. It's an organophosphate called cumaphos. And we did this treatment here where we followed the directions, brand new equipment, now you see it keeps the mite numbers down low. This one is a soft pesticide, formic acid, that you treat over a long time. It keeps the mites low. This one was a higher concentration for a very short period of time. And it did a good job initially, but the mites build back up. The surprise was when we look at what happened to viruses in those bees. They're 
viruses were already there. If we look at the untreated controls here at the top, you can see that this one virus build up over time. So this is initial and then 10 weeks later, that as the mites build up, it built up. So these pesticides that killed the mites kept the, mite, the viruses low. The problem was when we look at this other virus here, black and queen cell virus, when we look at what happened when we exposed the bees to this pesticide, either the kumaphos or forming gas, the incidence of those viruses and the levels of those increased much greatly. It was actually these colonies here that died out. It wasn't the untreated control over here. So we think that even these pesticides are applied at a level that won't kill the bee, doesn't appear to affect it, does have an effect at a sublethal level that it can exasperate these viruses. So part of our concern is that these agricultural chemicals or things that the beekeepers are applying may have an impact on the bees even without it obviously affecting them. So what happened? Well, when this call from Dave Hackenberg came together, many of us started looking at it, and we soon realized that this was not the ordinary. And uh, many of us became quite um, scared, literally, frightened by what we were seeing. So we joined together. So at Penn State University, we now have, um, by hook or crook, we have 14 people working on honeybees in different aspects. We also have Dennis Van Engelsdorf, Department of Agriculture, USDA ARS. We have Jeff Pettis and Judy Chen and Jay Evans at the Beltsville Lab. We also have Jerry Hayes at the Florida Department of Agriculture, North Carolina State, Dave Tarpey, University of Illinois. We have two extremely talented scientists, May Berenbaum and Jean Robinson, who are both National Academy of Science members. Um, um, Dewey Karen at University of Delaware, and then we've been joined recently by additional bee researchers from across the United States. Out of Montana, we also have a company that's a DOD sponsored company and their DOD affiliates. And then lastly, we were joined by, when we asked, a group at the Columbia University who are part of the Northeast Biodefense Center. And so this lab here does not normally ever think about insects. They're actually germ hunters. They look for germs that affect humans and mammals. So Ian Lipkin, who's at Columbia University, was one of the people who discovered West Nile virus when first got in the United States and were killing people. So this lab is sponsored in part by um, Department of Homeland Security funds to protect the United States. And they have tools that we went to and asked them to use. So this gives you an idea of the type of people here. So Jerry Hayes, Gene Robinson, Mae Berenbaum, Dennis Van Engelsdorf, Dave Tarpey, myself, Jay Evans, down at Beltsville, Marianne Frazier, Chris Mullen, and Jim Frazier and their talented lab tech, and then Jeff Pettis here. And then here's Ian Lipkin and one of his chief associates, Gustavo Paliosis. And we actually uh, entertain two prominent Australians there. So the entomologists in the crowd might recognize this, Dennis Anderson at Ian East. And when we started doing our research, and it'll become obvious why they were so highly interested. So what we started to do initially was what we wanted to do is figure out why CCD was occurring, determine how it worked, and then try to figure out how to keep it from happening again or mitigate it. And this is where we still are working to. So we initially set up a case study with 12 different operations. These were all migratory commercial operations, and they came from 10 different states. And we couldn't see any commonalities between them, that they'd been to the same place or done the same things. We set it up in a way to have a survey that they could be very truthful with us. So um, most of us didn't know who these guys or these operations were. It was kept secret so they could be very honest and tell us about things they were doing like antibiotic use or chemical use, tell us exactly what they were doing and how they were doing it. Also tell us about what kind of feed they used. So what we figured out very quickly was that there was no commonality here, especially with this Midas sign. One thing that we did learn is that most of them felt the need to do things that were not legal or registered, but they weren't doing the same thing. It wasn't the exact same compounds or the same mixture out there. Things that they had in common is that many of them, these migratory, had a dead out rate of greater than 30%. So normally, over the course of moving bees and that, they would lose 30%. We also learned that every time they put bees on a truck, they lost up to 10, 20% of their queens for some reason they died. So the way that they kept their numbers up was what they did something called splitting, where they took the equipment from the dead colony, put it on top of a strong colony, 
The queen would move up in there and start laying eggs, and the workers would take care of it. You take that equipment away, those workers could rear up a brand new queen. And so you go from one colony to two, and that works really well. So these beekeepers are, are pretty um, efficient in trying to make up their numbers. We also know that many of them experience stress, that for somehow they found that two months beforehand they either went through severe drought or had areas where they went into that didn't have adequate nutrition. So, Jeff Pettis and Dennis Van Engelsdorf went out both to Florida and to California to collect bees from these colonies and made observations. So we had control colonies. We also took bees out of my freezer at Penn State where we had bees that we knew what had happened to the colony over time, knew that many of them had these diseases. And we asked three things. One, were there any new or emerging pathogens, any environmental chemicals, and any stresses that might be impacting the bees here. So one thing that we saw was that row numbers were not that high in these colonies. Normally with row, we would think that you'd actually have to be up in here to get the colonies to collapse. So the CCD colonies, some of the strong colonies that were in that operation had higher numbers, but many of the weak or the recovering colonies actually had numbers that were not significantly different from the strong non-CCD co colonies. So we don't have any evidence of Roe as part of the problem here. Also, Nosema, the same thing, that we don't see that much difference between CCD. We did see that the Australian packages that were being brought in from Australia to help out with the pollination had a little bit higher levels, if you compare back to the others, but it wasn't significantly different. And one of the things that we did see in doing these bees, Dennis did a lot of bee autopsies where he took bees they were either sick or dying in the colony and looked inside. And inside of some of these bees, we saw these unique structures here, this white bodies, these encapsulations. And this is you not normally find in, in bees. And what we found is that you found them in the recovering bees that appeared to have had CCD and recovering from it. We still don't know what underlies this. The other thing that we saw is if you look at the sting gland here, this is the gland that produces the venom that the bee stings you with. Normally, it should be very white and not discolored, but what we saw was this blackening on it, this melanization. That indicates that you do have a disease response of some sort on this gland. So it suggested that there were some pathogens there that we don't normally have. Again, that was much higher in CCD colonies than in control colonies. So what we tried to do was go in and ask if there was something there, a brand new disease. And we did approach that was brand new to infectious disease. So it actually has helped set a precedent for looking at diseases even in humans. And what we did was we um, took the bees that had CCD and took them completely apart. We took all their nucleic acid, the DNA and RNA, the genetic material, and we sequenced it. So in that we had bee genes, obviously, but we had genes of every other organism that might be in there. We had bacteria, we had viruses, fungi, protozoa, the, the parasites, et cetera. We had everything right there. Luckily, the bee genome had been completed, so we could take that information and subtract all the bee genes from it, and what we're left with was everything else. We could then use the computers and run through databases and ask, what else did we have in there? What was it similar to? We also did that in or the bees that came out of these CCD operations, but also these historical bees and healthy bee colonies as controls. We also looked at potential routes of entry. We knew that since 2005, Australian bees had been brought into the United States to help with this pollination. It was the only time in 100 years that bees had been introduced to the United States. We also knew or learned that some beekeepers used royal jelly in their queen breeding. So in queen breeding, what you do is you take a colony that you really like the looks of, and you, what you do is you collect eggs and you put them into cells and put them into a queenless colony and they try to rear that larva up as a brand new queen. And to help that, some beekeepers did what they call wet grafting. So they took a little bit of royal jelly. This is a secretion that comes out of the head of the bees that there might be a quarter teaspoon, so 100 microliters or so in the cell. And they would add a little bit in with the egg and it increased the efficiency of that. Well, if you imagine, if you were a beekeeper and needed to collect this royal jelly, going out to grab a quarter teaspoon for maybe five or 10 cells in a colony, 
would be pretty labor intensive. So one route that these beekeepers found was that they could buy royal jelly. And the royal jelly was being brought in the United States not for beekeeping. It was being brought in for homeopathic use and also cosmetic use. So China, it turns out, produces 13,000 tons of royal jelly annually for export. So this is a quarter teaspoon in a cell. It blew my mind when I learned that these beekeepers are buying it in like a 10 liter quantity. I don't know what that translates, several gallons at least, and a one whack. So how you would ever get enough bees to collect that much, I don't know. But it's a major business and people are willing to pay significant amount of dollars to use it. So women think that it is the fountain of youth, that if you apply it to your face, it's an anti-wrinkle cream. And people have, have used it, stir a little bit, teaspoon into a glass of water or whatever to eat it, and it's going to improve your health. And I have signed friends, colleagues, who have two PhDs who swear by this. And it's like, okay, <laughs> not that I would ever do it, but okay. So anyway, they could buy this fresh ro imported royal jelly for about $20 a jar, an eight ounce jar. So we got some of that royal jelly from some of these beekeepers that were experiencing this, but also we purchased it directly from the importer too. So what did we find there? So we found lots of things. We, we found um, some bacteria in the bees here. Some of these we think are actually beneficial bacteria based on our study. We find them in every bee that we've looked at. Two other studies have found the same thing, and these studies were done in very different parts of the world at very different points in time. So we're kind of excited about this, because if you think about bacteria in association with animals, the more we look, the more we find there. So many of you have heard about Vannin or Dannon, uh, Activia type yogurts that they advertise now, you know, just a little bit of this and you drink it, and it's going to improve your immunity, help your digestion, et cetera we actually have beneficial bacteria in our own guts. So we think that maybe these same bacteria do the same thing for bees. So maybe someday we'll be feeding bees bee yogurt, not that we would give them people yogurt, but maybe some prophylactic treatment or probiotic treatments for bees. So maybe this. So there are our colleagues at University of Arizona, Nancy Moran, who might be continuing asking what these bacteria are doing. We also found fungi in these bees. So we had one group here, a mucor species, which actually, this was of concern initially. We don't find it in all CCD operations, some, but the mucor is one of the species that we see increased infections in humans even. And so mucor and aspergillus, the infections in humans has increased um, to a point of being a major concern, health concern. So we don't know how that's related. We also found another fungus here, Pandora, which I thought was aptly named. This only came out of the Australian packages. This is a fungus that is not found in the United States as far as we know of. We don't know what to expect from it. The, it's supposed to be an aphid parasite, not a bee parasite. But this came out of packages where there were only adult bees in there. So we are worried about what this means and potentially if this is another thing that could affect bees in the future. We found the two different Nosema species, Nosema serrana and Apis. And it wasn't a surprise because Nosema serrana, Jeff Pettis had learned and Judy Chen had, had been here for at least 10 years. And the reason why that's important is people in Europe have been blaming this particular pathogen on bee deaths there. There's unusual bee die-offs occurring in Europe, in India, in Taiwan, in Brazil, and many other parts of the world. And so this was one of the candidates some people suggested. We don't think that this is a major cause. We also found a new parasite in bees. It's related to a trypanosome, or a little tiny protozoan, this is, was in every bee, so it's a brand new finding, so we probably need to do a little bit more work with it. And then lastly, we found the viruses. Many of them were ones that we expected to find in bees and knew were there, but then we had down here at the bottom a brand new finding. This was a virus that I had never heard about. The data was there in these databases, but the papers hadn't come out. And it's called Israeli Acute Paralysis Virus here. And this virus was found a majority of all the CCD colonies and in all the CCD operations. And if you look at it versus the healthy or non-CCD colonies, we can say that it has about a 96% predictive value. You'd be 96% of the time right if you find it and say that this colony is apt to die to CCD 
And if we add in the other three pathogens here, if you find all four of them together, we can have a 100% prediction that you're going to die due to CDC, CCD. <clears throat> but this does not say that it's the cause. We still haven't said that it is the definite cause. We're just saying that it's a prediction value, like finding a marker, per se. But we do think it has distinct causes. It was identified in Israel in 2004 by Elon Sella because he found it in Israel. That's why he called it Israeli acute paralysis virus. We know that it's not just Israeli virus or U.S. virus, but we found it in the Australian bees as well that were being brought in the United States. We also found it in the royal jelly from China. We also know that it's now been found in Belgium, Spain, and um, we have other people telling us that they have evidence that might be there as well. So we don't know if it's just a really good marker for CCD or the actual cause. We do think that it needs something else if it is a cause. It, there are other t triggers out there. So we think that the chemicals and the nutritional stress are part of the problem here. One of the things that we've been doing is we've been asking how many different strains of IAPV do we have? And if you think like flu, flu strains, we see that you have different variants that come into the United States, and we try to predict ahead of time how many there are and where they came from. IAPV, we find that we have two different strains of virus in the United States. One that's predominantly found on the East Coast, the other one's on the West Coast, and interestingly, we cannot say that that virus that we find on the West Coast is separate from the Australian bees. We do think that the Australian bees are the source of this virus that came in on the West Coast. And so for some people, those are fighting words on both sides of the, of, of the major oceans that separate us. Um, so there are several beekeepers who argue from the beginning that the, you should never open the borders to allow Australian bees in. And there's Australians out there, some of those I showed you earlier, like Dennis Anderson and Ian East, who argue that um, this is not a cause and, and they don't have CCD and it's nothing to worry about. So we've had some interesting politics that go on with this. Also in Israel, we had interesting politics. So here's the initial virus that Yolan Sela found, and then these were samples that the Israelis contacted us way back when, when we were in the midst of trying to figure it out, asking us to look at things and to screen it. And it wasn't until we found the virus that we said, okay, we'll take these. And they sent us healthy samples and sick samples, but we didn't know which. It turned out all the sick samples had this virus, the Israeli acute paralysis virus, and the healthy samples didn't. And it wasn't until much later that they actually came back and said, yes, these colonies had what you guys are calling CCD, the same symptoms. That they didn't want to tell us that up front because there's a stigma associated with finding the virus there that all of a sudden for world trade issues, they don't want to claim having the same thing there. So where are we at? We still don't know if CCD or some of these other pathogens work together, but we are concerned here with the environmental chemicals. And so another group at Penn State, Chris Mullen, Marianne Frazier, and Jim Frazier, have been looking at both healthy colonies, especially ones that have gone to places where there are low or very little chemicals being used, and ones that are coming from CCD. And the big surprise here was the amount of chemicals that they found. So there have been many different pesticides used over historical times, and some of those are really nasty, like um, the organochlorines, like DTT, for those of you that remember it and it being banned. We actually find every class of pesticides that ever been used in these bees, in the wax, in the bee pollen that are in the hives. And some of these chemicals we don't know where they came from because they should have been banned long ago. So in healthy colonies, even, we do find these chemicals. So we see that there's a large number of these compounds that are out there. And the concern here is that the levels of some of these approach toxicity levels in some of these bees. And there have been some of these chemicals that we found coming out of some samples in Florida that were near citrus that were actually exceeded human toxicity. So that data was reported back to EPA and to the chemical companies because they had to go in and check to make sure that those chemicals were being properly used in the orchards to control a new pest that has been introduced there. So we, and good news is that when people have looked at honey, they haven't found the same thing. So we still think that honey is a very good food and healthy, that it's primarily in these other resources. 
The other thing that we were surprised by, but many of the beekeepers weren't, was the level of miticides that the beekeepers apply in the colony. And the levels are extremely high, and as you can see, we didn't find any colonies that didn't have this. In fact, we found that foundation wax, brand new wax that you can buy to put in your colonies, has this in there too. So it's raised concern about what we're seeing in there. And some of the concentrations here, again, approach toxicity levels. So if you remember, I showed you back earlier that we had data to say that these chemicals potentially could exasperate these diseases in the EB, that they might be part of the stress, and that's our concern right now. So we're doing experiments at Penn State to ask both the effects of these in-hive miticides, but also these environmental chemicals, what impacts do they have on the bee? There's some data that suggests that some of these may impact the bee's ability to learn. So if you think about a bee, when you get out there, it's like me trying to get from my house to go to the market. If I forget where I live, I may not get back home. So is this going to impact the bee's ability to get back home after going out to forage? Or can it impact the bee's ability to defend itself against disease? Just like ourselves, bees, we think, if you're under stress, even chemical stress, that your immunity or ability to fight off diseases might be impacted. So we are highly concerned by this. Included in these compounds over here was another class of chemicals that the beekeepers have been trying and really wanting to point fingers to. Many of us are highly concerned about it. They're called neonicotinoids, and I had to practice saying that a bajillion times. So things like imatocloprid. And why is that important? So for everyone in this room, if you think about what you do in your home environment, you're using some of these chemicals. We can't get away from them. This has become the predominant pesticide used to control uh, fleas in our pets. It's been be predominant use in controlling pests on your trees or grubs in your garden or Japanese beetles on your roses. And if, the amazing thing is if you go to visit the farmer and look at the chemicals that he has, they have the same concentration, the same amounts that you can buy down in your home and garden store. The difference is if you look at his bag of chemicals, it has several things on there. One is the human warning, you know, use very carefully and prevent uh, poisoning yourself. And it also has two other warnings. One is keep it out of the water because this will kill the invertebrates out there. And the third warning, which is really important, is do not spray when there's blooming plants around or when the bees are present because the bees are highly sensitive to these. But the, our concern and our surprise was if you go to the home and garden store, the exact same chemical, exact same amount has a human warning, but it's missing in many cases the warning about not putting it in the water supply and not applying it on your plants when the bees are visiting it. So many of us, including myself, we may have been inadvertently exposing bees to some of these chemicals because we were putting it out there on the roses or on the flowers or in our trees or on the lawns to control the grubs and not realizing it. So that's one of our concerns too. So for beekeepers, we do have a series of recommendations. One is to try to use soft controls, not these hardcore pesticides. So things like the formic acid or some people even claim such essential oils. We also are telling people to control the nosema by putting the drug in there to help control the nosema levels. The main recommendations are is stay away from using that dead out equipment or moving things around from one hive to another because you are moving the diseases from one colony to another colony. So what do you do? If you're a small beekeeper, we know that if you extensively wash the frames, get rid of the honey and the bee bread, and that, get rid of most of the wax, you can reuse it. We've done that before. And that's a lot of work. So we are finding that there are irradiation facilities, and I know our own state beekeepers in Pennsylvania are coming together to figure out if they can band together to send shipments off to be irradiated. For some of the big migratory outfits, there's a facility in Florida and one in, in California that they can actually take the bee colonies in this dead out equipment and irradiate semi-loads and do it very quickly and very fast and very effectively. And there's evidence from our studies that that does work. The last part is, what about all these other insects that are out there doing pollination in the ecosystem and the world around us? Do we have to worry about them? And unfortunately, we have new data in my lab that suggests that we might do, because we have been finding that the pollen the bees are collecting may have some of these same viruses. And we also have evidence that some of these 
Other species like bumblebees and many solitary bees can also become infected with these viruses. So we are highly worried about what's happening in honeybees. Is there, are they just the sentinel animal here, the canary in the cage that are reporting what's going on in these other insects? And there is concern there because there was this report that came out in the end of 2006 from the National Academies of Science. And this was a report that's extremely well done. You can go online and, and purchase this or read it there online and get a PDF copy. There's also a, an executive summary that summarizes it. And but what it says in there with a lot of data and statistics and it's written in a way that most people can understand is that all pollinators, so things like bats, um, hummingbirds, all the bees, butterflies, flies, the honeybees, that we see a decrease in number of species, that we've actually seen several bumblebee species become extinct. We can no longer find them. And we see the population size of each of these species decreasing. And right now in the Northeast, it hasn't hit the press as much as, as bees did, but they're, they're finding that many bat colonies in the Northeast have these unusual fungal diseases and they're seeing deaths in the bats. So I know Ian Lipkin has seen some of these same bats come into his lab to try to figure out what diseases are there and why it might be occurring. So um, we are worried greatly about it. The other thing that we know that probably you and I can both do is thinking about habitat for pollinators. So this is a scene what you might see in Pennsylvania. And to us, it looks very nice and neat and orderly. And you look at it out here, but what the bee sees is basically this that there's a desert there. there. There's nothing there for any of these pollinators to eat. So we're thinking that one of the things that you and I could do both do is plant gardens for bees or other pollinators. So figuring out, even in the balcony area, planting enough plants we think would be significant if you add it all together. So we are at Penn State coming up with recommendations, working together for recommendations for hedgerows in agricultural areas to plant plants that other pollinators and bees would like to use for nesting and also for food in home gardens that you could plant flower gardens that would be important and even on balconies. And then there's this new technology called green roofs to use in cities where instead of having a bare roof with all the water coming down and running off, you can plant actually the roofs with plants. And it saves the water from running off. It actually improves air conditioning, but it would give environment and habitat for these pollinators as well. And it turns out in many of the European countries, they've seen a loss or decrease in their biodiversity, and they're using these green roofs to try to build that back up. So we think that that'd be important. So this is a website for the Pollinator Partnership, or here, and so they helped sponsor the stamps that we'd seen earlier. So you can see that they also say the same thing, plant for pollinators, watch for them, and then also reduce your impact, and this is where the judicious use or wise choice of some of these insecticides and applying them in your garden and your, your yard might be important. So I guess asking yourself if you really do need to get rid of every last dandelion or control those Japanese beetles before they show up, is that really that important? Personally, I think dandelions are very beautiful, but I may be weird. <laughs> and lastly, we are concerned. So we still think that this is a, a threat to our food supply here in the country. So you may have already heard this, that a third of, of your diet, or one out of every three bites that you eat every day, you have to thank the bees and the other insects here for, that it comes from these pollination. So, um, and 80% of that's due to the bees. So the growers here are dependent upon the bees and the beekeepers here. And our main worry here is keeping those beekeepers in business, that there aren't that many of these migratory beekeepers out there. And they're a rather unique lot of people, so they have to be sort of jack of all trades. They not only have to know the bees very well and be able to work it, but they have to be long distance truck drivers, businessmen, and then major repair people that do these things. So we're worried that if these companies go out of business, we're not seeing that there's going to be a huge number of people jumping in to fill their shoes. And so the concern is what's going to, to do the pollination for these growers there. So. Other of my colleagues are saying, be nice to your friendly beekeeper here. So honey, uh, one of my colleagues says it's the most es ethical sweetener out there. You have the less energy use in getting it to your table. It's actually semi-healthy for you. People claim that there are weight loss diets on honey, whether you believe it or not. <laughs> and then 
Um, it also keeps the beekeepers in business, so be nice to your local beekeeper. So we have to thank a lot of people for funding here. We haven't seen the major funding come from the legislature at the national level, even though many of us have testified, even though many of us have testified, even though many of us have testified.